So 
I'm speaking to a creditors uh, in, uh, in, in Japan. I'm speaking to the equivalent of higher education uh, uh, commissioners in, uh, in Europe. I'm speaking to university presidents in North Africa. Uh, and and they're all asking exactly the same questions that we're going to talk about um, talk about today. And I'm going to look and start with us to the U.S. As, as, uh, um, uh, as, as, as we are about our system for, for answers. So, so I'm looking forward. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at uh, a roadmap for the future um, that, that picks up where this book leaves off. Those of you who have read the book know that the book ends with a question. Um, what does the University of the 21st Century look like? Uh, it's a question I didn't want to address in 2008. I didn't even want to address it a year ago. But, but now we're starting to see the roadmap. We're starting to see what is likely to happen, not only to our institutions, but to the global enterprise of higher education. So, what I'm going to do is spend a half an hour or so just kind of not going into a lot of depth on these topics, but teeing up what I think the major issues are. Uh, and then we have microphones placed uh, around the room, and I'm hoping we can engage this group uh, in, um, uh, in a discussion. Um, so, what's going on? I, I think asking this group what's going on uh, it has to be a rhetorical question because, because you see it uh, you see it every day. For me, the, um, the interesting uh, answer to the question, what's going on, uh, is, is the story in the, the, the Moody's downgrade in January of, of the higher education sector. Um, you know, Moody's, uh, every year or so, uh, takes a look at higher education as a, uh, as a sector. It's, what, 5% of U.S. GDP, so it's a big part of, of, the, um, uh, of the economy. And, 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 um, and trying to project uh, uh, financial risk for that for that sector and it's been up and down uh, on higher rates for a while um, and and uh, you know they didn't run into the whole sector during the the height or the depth of the recession and it sort of came up again just in order they downgraded uh, they downgraded everything uh, and, and the real things I think are the um, uh, are the touchstones for what this conversation uh, is uh, is all about. Um, I'll just, I'll just read you the five reasons that they gave for the, for the, for the, for the downgrade. We're going to enrollment at half of the institutions that are covered. This is at a time when, when student demand is increasing, falling in love. Increased tuition. We don't want to hear about that. You hear about it every, every day. You can't be involved in, uh, in higher education and not be confronted with the fact that, that our costs, or at least our prices, uh, are, are increasing at a rate that's probably not sustainable. Discounts. You look at the building, uh, interactive metrics of debt to income um, for institutions, 70% uh, of the institutions in this country uh, are suffering from, from an unfavorable uh, debt to income ratio because they are discounting below their actual their actual costs. In fact, they're discounting below not only their actual costs, but their costs um, uh, modified by all possible sources of income. You can't do that very long and stay in, uh, and stay in business. Can you conduct an annual poll of uh, the American public to see whether or not they think um, there's value being delivered for? Tuition dollar uh, for the past thirty years. Um, that number has been uh, has been highly positive. Two years ago, the majority of the people who responded to the, the, the Pew poll said that they no longer believe that tuition dollar is worth the money. Move this question. Move money. How many people in the room have never heard of a MOOC? You wouldn't say it yet. Um, I don't even know if you're a MOOC. 
is to take the 18 or 20 courses in the genome sequence that occupy 80% of the student uh, credit hours in the first two years. Uh, in Gilded students, some institutions, um, uh, a lower cost option and probably a more effective option. And when we talk about anthropology 101, we're in our role of, of, of introductory physics, what we're doing in our role of, believe it or not, from Georgia Tech, uh, of English composition. Uh, it is professors have been doing this for a long time, kind of reimagining what that classroom might look like. Uh, and if you look at the open-ended comments from the students, uh, it's, it's really kind of inspiring. Um, there are comments from Georgia Tech students, there are comments from Georgia Tech alumni, there are comments from high school students in rural Bangladesh, uh, in, uh, in central India, uh, and, and, and the other thing is that um, I can't believe that I have access to this. I can't believe I have access to this. I can't believe that I'm going to learn uh, control theory from Magnus Eggerson. I can't believe that I get to uh, to learn uh, apply statistics from Tucker Walsh. I can't I can't believe that I get access to the resources that I would never have access to. And we have to find all teachers. Who are the ones that are really like, um, I don't have a lot of resources to supplement my IP curriculum. I don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of um, supplemental materials um, to prepare students for, um, uh, for IB courses. Uh, but now I do. Now I do. Now I have an asset that's been dropped in my, uh, in my lab. So that's the of technology. Um, and those of you who read the book now, I don't lead with technology, but this business of technology has been uppermost in my mind for the last 18 months or so. Because it occurred to me that all the technology is not the point. The point is offering value to our students at an affordable cost, assuring good outcomes. Technology removes constraints. Technology removes the you can't from the from the equation. What do I mean? What do I mean by that? What's uh, been for a long time? Thirty years or so. How to organize classrooms for good outcomes? Benjamin Bloom, Columbia University of Chicago educational researcher. Uh, uh, Corral had students in the early 80s to do a meta study. A meta study is a study that looks at other people's studies. Um, to do a meta study of uh, what it means to organize a classroom for success. And then, and then Bloom looked at the traditional classroom, much like what we have today. Someone like me standing in front of a senior group like you. Uh, and and you know, this kind of one way one way flow of information. Every once in a while, uh, you decide to give a test, uh, and as a result of that test, you stratify people into good people and bad people. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because everyone moves on anyway. Um, that's the normal answer. Why don't we call it the mastery classroom? What's a mastery classroom? A mastery classroom is a classroom in which you don't move on to the next topic until you've mastered the previous topic. He also said what other people have said about organizing a classroom in that way. And what other people have said in that class across ability levels, geographies, uh, image levels, uh, what other people have said. If you can really do that, if you really organize your classroom to be a mastery classroom, you move everyone, everyone in the class by a standard deviation. Then it's a standardized test course, you move everyone to the 95 percent up. Do you have something interesting? But if you personalize delivery, for example, by a one-on-one -on -one tutor as part of this process, you will be the one that has a standard deviation to the 98%. And that's the only result 
It's possible for a lot of me who comes from outside the education research community that I'm probably speaking couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it in 1982. Mr. King, the most famous educational researcher in the country, had published a paper called The Two Sigma Problem, which is that if we can solve the Two Sigma Problem, we can improve learning outcomes for everyone that we touch. And then we'll have to at the end of the paper that I think is what has been the sticking point in implementing the Bloom Two Sigma approach. It's cost. I have to organize a classroom so that everyone proceeds at his or her own rate. We gotta have some answers because not everyone is gonna learn in that 13, 14, 15, 15 weeks. Sometimes it will take two semesters, sometimes it will take three years in order to make the progress that you need in order to move on to the next the next topic. And that's all I'm going to do. It's going to blow the roof off everything. You can't do that. Except with technology. You can remove the UKs. That's one of the interesting things to me about what's going on with MOOCs. I don't know that because I think MOOCs are the answer to anything. I think MOOCs are a prototype. MOOCs are a demonstration of how you can implement the one mandatory classroom concept in a way that fits within the budget constraints, the resource constraints that we that we have. And if you look at the MOOCs, the ones that are done well, they all have this characteristic. You may have noticed that in a lot of these MOOCs, there are tests that are interspersed every 17 minutes or so. You see 15, 15, 17 minutes worth of video. And they say, you have a little test. And you're not supposed to move on until you figure out why you don't understand the stuff that you didn't understand, understand before. And there's no cost associated with that. No additional classroom time, no additional TA time. You know, it is simply part of the of the mastery of the mastery concept. It's not in part because not so difficult because we all know that the internet is very good at personalization. Anyone who's ever been startled by a message from Amazon suggesting a book that you didn't know that you wanted has seen the effects of personalization. The digital technology is being um, is being used. I think it removes the the UKIPS. Um, some things that we know about in the traditional classroom. I've been talking now for I don't know, 25 minutes. Uh, and then three quarters of you have been thinking about the pool or the flat room or who's cutting the grass. We play with your own day. And then, and then, in a format like this, your attention span is about five minutes. It's about five minutes for an important reason. Um, you know, blind things like concentrating enough to fill up your short term memory. You know, I'll learn things by transferring things from short term memory to long term memory. It's a more difficult process that requires deliberate practice, that requires trial and error, that requires the kind of mastery skills that we talked about a second ago. But the short term memory issue is a big deal in a classroom because the number of the same concepts that you can fit in your short term memory is pretty small, maybe five. A really good seven. Because you have more than five concepts. Now, most of you have overflow in your 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 short term memory stack, and, and you're trying to figure out what to uh, what to do with it. But um, that what it looks like in a classroom. That's repeated hundreds of thousands of times over the course of an academic year. And it means that students, some of us students get a 45 minute lecture, uh, are either doodling or checking Facebook uh, or uh, decided that, that their time can be better used uh, at the local Starbucks. They're just not there. 
We're just not there. And if someone comes back, there's somebody confirms us. You can watch the ebb and flow of constant of concentration. A high level count, but you can't just stop every five minutes or so. Conduct a deliberate practice exercise to help move things into long term a long term memory. Except with technology, you can't. Technology removes more than you you can't. We think of as barriers to adopting new ways of doing business. How do we how do we account for credit hours? How do we how do we find credit in this situation? We know transactions count the number of hours that the students spend in this case. You have to account for what they do and what they know and what they and what they demonstrate. And that has to be accounted for across students, across institutions, across curricula over in Orangate County, you can't do that. How would you do something like that? Except with technology, you can't. You can track all of this. But we pay money to have students attend these classes. The federal government provides a grant for students to attend these classes. And then and it provides loans for students to attend these classes. And the way that we decide what classes they can attend are you know, the institutions have presented us with a model that is tuned to combine the number of hours that a student spends in the classroom. And whether or not they may get through this incredible array of, of gates at the end of the class that separates winners from losers, passes from, from fails. How would you do things any other way? How would you, how would you track the flow? of federal dollars into higher education if you couldn't track things based on those input metrics. In fact, we can. We can use exactly the same technology that we're talking about to track the flow of federal dollars. We, we can, for example, when we put a dollar into a student's pocket, not into the tuition coffers of an institution, but into a student's pocket to spend on education services that are going to help and whether or not that dollar being spent actually actually helps. You know, the technology enables us to, to do that. Is it, the, is it a higher education, education in general? But please bear with me, I can only think about my short term memory is, is, is filled. I can only think about higher education. Um, higher education um, has become a network business. You know, every sense of the word. Uh, and it's like, I don't know, it's not a technology sense, it's an economic, economic sense. It's a network business. We are all responsible for platforms. We're not responsible for businesses that take dollars in and produce products at the other end. We're, we're responsible for complex economic platforms that have a variety of stakeholders, usually with competing interests, a variety of income sources, and a variety of value propositions that are going to determine success or failure. It's the only way we can do research in a research university. It's the only way we can subsidize performing arts centers. It's the only way that we can subsidize, um, uh, subsidize um, uh, interclusion athletics. Because we have this ability to balance values with income. We're not doing very well right now, but I would argue it's because we're not using the resources that have been, have been given us. So, if you know, you're going to research university, if you don't have uh, a donor with deep pockets, that's going to enable you to experiment with these new technologies. I was really. You can tell what's happened over the last three years as a gift from him. Do you consider all of the new content that you find in the MOOC producers as assets that you didn't have at your disposal before? They're assets. Coursera alone has 350 courses on the books. But there are 350 courses that none of you had access to a year ago. What you do today, what you do with is up to you. For most of you, I think it would be a huge mistake to say, well, you know, my English composition course 
uh, it's just as good as Georgia Tech's. I think I'm going to spend three hundred thousand dollars putting up a uh, live version of my English composition, of course. Internally, that that people come to us that they want to know why the Purdue uh, interaction with the of course is any better than the course at at, at Georgia Tech. Uh, I don't want to do a book on, on introduction to physics. It's a three hundred thousand dollar investment, and we're simply not going to make that investment. Why? Because it's out there already. Because the professor comes up with the argument that the student is going to be better off for having taken the course, and then comes up with the what we're going to do with these courses. The point of that is, I want to have a master's in computer science. Book based. Six thousand dollars. Start between twenty-four and thirty thousand dollars for a bricks and mortar version of this master's degree. We're going to offer it in book format for six thousand dollars, and then we we'll make a fair amount of money because the efficiencies allow us to do that once we get the number of students up. And then, and then, and then that's the important part. And we're going to involve in this project. Believes. To their choice, that the degree will be of equal or higher quality than the um, than the than the in person and master's degree. So we have an idea what we're doing with our with our courses. We are able to do the same graduate on schedule because we have physical structural constraints in online courses. We can remove those constraints. By making those courses in book format. Those courses are going to be available to the world. There's no cost to us in doing that, but they're also available to our students in our classrooms with our professors, with our with our exams getting credit from Georgia Tech. It's not going to be one of those models. I don't want to do it. I want to proliferate. I, I, I just think that what this is right now is the first step toward. These experiments as to what a university could be in ten years, and we don't know in terms of what our institution is going to look like. That's the kind of broad strokes of that, that Georgia Tech's role among technological universities. We don't know how many of our classrooms are going to be blended. We don't know how many of our of our terminal master's degrees are going to be delivered by an open uh, an open format. Um, we can guarantee that, that it's going to be a different institution a year from now than it was today, just like today is a different institution than it was a year ago. That's something that's really important. How do, you, how do you get to the point where you can conduct those experiments at institutional scale? And by the way, we're conducting these experiments at a system wide scale. The University System in Georgia announced a partnership with Coursera. That will have the only result in the delivery of its online programs, the existing online programs, in MOOC format with access to all of the course catalog that I talked about. Not only courses produced locally by University of Georgia institutions, but American Poetry at Penn, Economics at Michigan, Health Science at Johns Hopkins. All of that is going to be available to students who. Enroll in the University System of Georgia online online courses. Not because the University System of Georgia is going to invest massively in the creation of these courses, but because it's going to look at that asset that's out there and figure out what to do what to do with it. So I think that I think open things up for for discussion, and, and, and I think that. The best way to tie around around my comments right now is is to go back to how I started this discussion. We are moving very quickly. If the things I'm talking about today weren't even glimmered in my mind when I started to write Avalar to Apple in 2008, and then I wrote this article to Avalar to Apple, I had to look at ten years and make those same kinds of forecasts. And it scares me to death because all of us can see what's happening right now, projecting that out over the next five to ten years, just seems to me to be um, a, a frightening 
um, the financial aspect. So, so what we think is kind of irrelevant. Yeah, so it's a matter of how hard it goes to follow. But it doesn't matter whether we like the technology revolution that's taking place. It doesn't matter whether or not we decry the loss of romance in attending a traditional college. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is, is how do we anticipate what is going to be the best for our students? How do we anticipate regaining that trust with our stakeholders? How do we participate in what's going to be a global conversation? And the, 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 the privileged position that we have today in this country, the starting position that we have in this country is not secure. Because all of the usual prospects are going through the same kind of reinvention process. Some of them are starting down here instead of up here, but they are investing a lot of money. The amount of money going into remaking higher education in the Persian Gulf countries is mind-boggling. It's staggering. The president of Caltech has just gone to be the president um, of, of the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia because that's a really attractive place to be. Now, it's not a particularly attractive place to be, but if you want to go back to the if you want to figure out what the university is going to look like, there is a place to conduct the, the, the experiment. And a lot of them are going to take hold with us. Uh, and right, right now, um, the public universities uh, have, have, uh, uh, have been divided on how much to invest in this, how much to invest emotionally, intellectually, sociologically, uh, and, um, uh, and financially in these kinds of experiments. But the ones that are engaged are really engaged. Uh, they are large research institutions. It means that they have the resources to do this. But you can smaller institutions, more specialized mission institutions come along and say, oh, I want to try this, I want to make use of these, um, of these, of these assets. And we say, thank you, you know, now we can have this conversation again, uh, and smile about the use of the word no, just as I'm smiling about the word apple in the title of my book, because something will come along to replace that, that is so far beyond what we can imagine today, um, that, that we didn't incorporate it into our, into our plan. And it's going to affect outcomes, it's going to affect price, it is going to affect public trust, it's going to affect the opinion of our stakeholders on what we're, um, on what we're doing. So, so I think you know, that's, that's a good point to wrap up my remarks and, um, and see what the audience says. Thank you.